Greetings to everyone and welcome to this Physics Today webinar, organized and sponsored by Zurich Instrument. Maybe you've seen some of Zurich Instrument advertising in your favorite physics journal. Now we'd like to deliver some content as well, and I hope you'll enjoy. My name is Romain Stomp, and I am an SPM application scientist at Zurich Instrument, and I have the honor of being your host today. So within the next hour, we will cover some uh, hot topics in near-field optics in the broader context of light-matter interaction at the nanoscale. So this will bring us to nanoimaging at the molecular level and to single quantum state control in this special regime of strongly confined light. So here is the list of our speakers for today. So we've compiled an exciting program that will start with our first speaker, so Claudius Rick, our resident photonics application expert, who will set the stage and highlight some of the technical challenges and optimizing process that are often needed in this experimental nano-optical setup. So this talk will be followed by long-standing customers and prestigious speaker, Professor Markus Raschke, that will provide us with new insights on some of the most recent advances in nano-optics, and who will be supported by Samuel Johnson uh, from the same lab. So please note that this webinar is being recorded and will be available on demand within the next 24 hours. It can be accessed using the same audience link that was sent to you earlier. So while we are at it, let me go through a few housekeeping items. So at the bottom of your um, audience console are multiple applications with widget. And probably the most important one is the Q&A widget where you can submit your question in a written form. We encourage you to ask as many questions as you'd like at any time using this feature. We will try to answer as many as possible during this webinar at the end of these two presentations from Claudius and Marcus. So we do capture all questions and we intend to provide answers to all of them. So don't worry if your question is not answered today, we can answer them later by email. We will also release a blog that will summarize some of the main topics uh, covered uh, during this webinar, so stay tuned. Some additional material are available in the resource list a widget that looks like a green folder at the bottom of your screen. You can expand your slide area by clicking on the maximize icon on the top of the on the top right of the slide area. And if you have any technical difficulty during this webinar, please click on the help widget. It has a question mark icon and cover common technical issues. Okay, so I'm sure you're ready to move on. So let's introduce our first speaker for today. And please, Claudius, feel free to start sharing your screen uh, while I finish with the introduction so that there is no downtime. So Claudius Rick holds a PhD in ultra-fast non-linear optics from the University of Constance in Germany. He then crossed the border with Switzerland and joined us in Zurich. And by now, he wears many hats at Zurich Instrument, often related to photonics, and is responsible for the UHF LI platform, our ultra high frequency lock in amplifier that features as well the world's fastest box car aperture. That will be covered in his talk as well. So, having worked with Claudius on many different topics, it is my pleasure to pass him the mic in Zurich. Claudius, please go ahead. Thank you, Roma, for the great introduction. Uh, I also enjoy a lot working together with you. Um, before we start with the main topic, uh, let me introduce you to you, Zurich Instrument. So at Zurich Instrument, we have one clear mission. We want to provide the best in class dynamic uh, signal instruments for advanced R&D labs. And we still want to maintain uh, that users have a real plug and play user experience. How do we do that? Um, we do that by taking commercially available uh, components. Uh, this is also what our customers can do. So what really makes the difference is the software. The software includes the HDL uh, software put onto the FPGAs in our instruments, which does the real-time signal processing, as well as the user interface and the API. And this outstanding uh, functionality and feature set it in the end really allows for a very efficient workflow we are aiming for. Yeah. Um, by adding even more features uh, to the instruments, they get more valuable over time. Uh, 
And in the end, this leads to a broad portfolio of devices, uh, lock-in amplifiers, we have boxcar averages. Um, based on our lock-in amplifiers, we develop an impedance analyzer and we provide AWG, so arbitrary waveform generators as well. They we combine with the um, technology, partially from our lock-in amplifiers, to our QCCS, the Quantum Con Computing Control System, which is the first commercially available one. Today, we will focus on the measurement portfolio, how would I, I would call it, so mainly lock-in amplifiers and box car averages. So, what can you expect in the next 20 minutes in my talk? We will start with the almost philosophical goal, which is as trivial as it is correct. In general, we want to capture as much information as possible within one measurement. The problem though, we do not have access to the information directly. It is contained in the signal, so this is what we need to analyze. And unfortunately, signals uh, contain noise that affects the information quality. So what is crucial to understand is how to get as much information out of a signal as possible and therefore uh, choose the appropriate measurement scheme. So later on in his talk, Markus will then uh, go the next step. He will show us some examples of the underlying physics phenomena that can cause uh, the individual signals and what actually the information which we can provide actually does. And I'm already very curious to see and learn more about this. But now let's jump into it and have a look what is the information in the signals we're looking for. So in a typical measurement, we vary one parameter and we measure the change in the associated signal. For example, this can be switching off on and off something and we can see and read off a certain amplitude or a duration, something like that. Um, of course, this is only true for linear response functions. Uh, we will come later to the nonlinear ones. Just take a few slides. Um, and this modulation uh, can be performed also in a sinusoidal fashion. For example, if you use a chopper wheel uh, on a laser or if you have a cantilever oscillator. And if you have this sinusoidal modulation there uh, and the phase of the signal. If you do not only vary one but multiple parameters in the sinusoidal fashion, we will see that there is an interplay of multiple parameters which in the end uh, interact in a mixture of sinusoids. Therefore, we need to measure multiple parameters at the same time. But this is what will come later on. Let's start with uh, the actual more simple approach, the sinusoidal excitation. So all signals uh, which we will have a look at also have the noise contribution, I already mentioned this. And to overcome those, we use a, we'll use a lock-in amplifier um, to, to capture this modulated signal. So what does a lock-in amplifier actually do? A lock-in amplifier takes the signal input on the very top left, and it takes a reference signal. So the reference signal is the information which you put into the lock-in amplifier, which tells the lock-in amplifier what is the modulation you do. Uh, the lock-in mixes uh, those two signals. Uh, in fact, in the digital uh, signal processing, this is a multiplication of the both signals with each other, and it sends it uh, through a low-pass filter. Due to the mixer, due to the multiplication and the low pass filtering, uh, the actual modulation frequency drops out. And as a result, we have two quadratures, so to say. We have the amplitude R and the phase theta, which are the two parameters uh, which we want to measure of the sinusoidal um, excitation. Now, there are basically three parameters um, which you can change in a lock-in amplifier. First is the modulation frequency, uh, so you can select the frequency range uh, where you have ideally lowest amount of noise uh, and where you can then shift your signal to. In addition, you have the filter bandwidth and the filter order. So this tells you basically how, um, how much noise you uh, or uh, how, how much noise you can suppress, how much noise left in the filter, but it also tells you uh, how fast you can measure or how slow you have to measure. Why would you want to do this? You want to do this because um, there is an underlying 
noise uh, contribution. First of all, you have uh, 1 over F noise, which uh, is kind of more prominent at the lower frequencies, and then you have the white noise level, this is kind of um, the fundamental noise covering in the same way over the entire frequency range. And ideally, you, uh, in addition, you have a few nice noise peaks, and ideally you want to select a frequency range where you have as less noise as possible. Therefore, you want to mod uh, modulate the excitation with a frequency which supports this. Of course, there are boundary conditions. It's always important to keep this into mind. Afterwards, you uh, analyze it with a lock-in amplifier and you do the measurement. Now, this leads to a straightforward workflow if for a lock-in measurement. So first of all, ideally, you characterize your noise floor. Then you select the best modulation frequency you optimize your filter bandwidth and the filter order accordingly. And in the end, you perform the measurement. Ideally, you can then very nicely distinguish, for example, a good measurement shown in blue compared to a measurement where the parameters could have been optimized better uh, displayed in gray. I think this is very helpful for everybody um, who wants to, who, who is working with lock-ins in the lab. Now, if you, this is true for all lockets. If you have a modern lock-in amplifier, though, there is more. So first of all, we have already a digitized signal, so it's nothing easier than displaying it in the time domain and in the frequency domain. This is a very helpful tool. It's basically oscilloscope uh, functionality. It's super helpful to quickly uh, have a look at your entire um, at, at your entire signal and find, for example, spurious noises. In addition, um, you can have an integrated PLL and PID controller, which uh, can use the very output of the lock and amplifier as an error signal, and therefore minimizes the delay in the signal processing chain. For example, you can ensure that you always drive uh, something on resonance by locking it uh, with a PLL and driving it at the same amplitude by uh, using a slightly slower PID controller on top of it. In addition, what you can do as well is you can do multi-sideband analysis on the very same signal with one device only. Why would that be needed and uh, well, why is this important? We'll look at now. In the beginning, I already mentioned, so you will, you will have experiments where you want to vary multiple parameters. This leads typically to a mixture of signals, and you mesh, want to measure all of those parameters. So how do they come about? Now, if you have two modulations in an experiment, the very simple way, you have kind of the carrier depicted as big omega here, um, which is a high frequency, and a smaller frequency, small omega, which is doing the modulation. Yeah. Um, those two frequency on its own, they carry only the information of one parameter change, of the modulation of one parameter. But if you look at the mixed signal, so at the upper and lower sideband close to the carrier, um, those uh, depend on the, on the information of both modulations. And now there are kind of two possibilities to uh, actually measure those. First of all, we have the good old tandem demodulation, and second, we have a we call AM-FM direct demodulation. But it's not only kind of the carrier and the modulation and two harmonics and two uh, and two sidebands. It can be more, and this is because of the influence of nonlinearity. So, if you have one modulation and you have nonlinearities, this will lead to harmonics of in, in uh, of your signal. So for example, two omega, three omega, four omega, depending on the nonlinearity. If you have two modulations though, it's a little bit more complicated because now the nonlinearities can create multiple sidebands. So you have, for example, uh, one times the carrier minus four times the modulation and so on. Now to unravel the contribution of the different interactions what you want to do is you want to capture the harmonics of the carrier and its sidebands. Um, and then, for example, the ratio of the even and odd harmonics can tell you about the contribution of even and odd nonlinear effects. And here, I think, is also a great connection uh, to the presentation from Marcus later on. 
he will have a few very fascinating physical phenomena um, where that can be recovered um, based on the information and uh, the signal on the signal of different um, sidebands, for example. In general, what you can say, the more side Banks, you can add the more information you will also get about your nonlinear interaction. And this is where it comes into play how you detect those. So we have uh, first of we, I, I prepared uh, comparison between the tandem demodulation and the AMFM demodulation. So in the tandem demodulation, it's basically a two stage process. First, you take a uh, Ockham uh, amplifier. You feed in the signal, and you feed in the carrier, uh, the carrier omega. There, you use a broad bandwidth of the lock-in amplifier to demodulate uh, around the carrier, and you want to collect all the information from the dis different sidebands close to the carrier. Then you take this signal, and you feed it into the next lock-in amplifier in which you feed in the modulation reference frequency small omega as the reference frequency. And the second uh, lock-in amplifier will then demodulate the signal um, at the then sideband, so at the lower frequency, and the output there, or what you measure there, is really the information on the sideband. So there is no need to follow frequency combinations, just doing two lock-ins after each other. Now the point is, first of all, you need two lock-ins, and um, you might want to uh, look kind of at differences on several sidebands. So this is why there is the AM-FM demodulation. It's a direct demodulation on each sideband. So what you do here is slightly different. You use uh, you use the signal coming from your experiment, and now you feed in both reference frequencies. So you, you um, feed in the carrier lock big omega and the modulation frequency small omega. The lock-in amplifier will calculate by itself uh, the combination. And there you can choose if you want to go, for example, uh, omega minus four small omega or two uh, times the carrier minus uh, one times the modulation. So all of those combinations are possible. So you can pick your uh, sideband in which you're interested in. And this, I think, is a very interesting uh, additional way of directly demodulating, directly capturing the data uh, in comparison to the tandem demodulation. Now, I would like to move uh, to a slightly different topic because so far we only discussed about sinusoidal um, signals. Now, what about if the signal is not sinusoidal anymore? A very typical example is pump probe measurements. Pump probe measurements, they have two uh, ultra short, uh, ultra short uh, laser pulse strains, um, which are which are separated by a certain time delay. Um, the pump pulse uh, interacts with your sample and imprints a signal uh, onto the coinciding probe pulses. What the mechanism behind this is depends really on what uh, is the what is the physical phenomena you're exploring. Um, and then here on the very top you, right hand side, you see that kind of on every second pulse, you have uh, kind of information stored on, on the other pulse is not. Um, now, the pulse per, probe pulse strain is analyzed. We want to take out this data. And now we can do a measurement and step, uh, step the time delay. And what we will be able to measure is really the, uh, the response, um, response of the sample uh, to those short, uh, short, ultra short pulses. Um, with a resolution which is basically limited by the duration of the two laser pulses. Yeah. Now, what do we ideally do to analyze this? If we look, um, if we look at the signal, it's depicted on the left hand side in uh, orange. You see the pulses are very short in time, so this means they are spread out very far in the frequency domain. And what becomes apparent if we uh, look at the filter function of a lock and amplifier, it will only capture a single harmonic of the entire signal. So what we need to 
do, we need to find a way on uh, collecting more information, which is in the harmonics of that signal. And this we can do by filtering in the time domain. So we use a, basically a rectangular window, which uh, is kind of one during the pulse and zero at all other times. So we capture and integrate the signal only during the pulse. Now, um, on the right hand side in the frequency domain, you already see you have the fundamental frequency and you have uh, signals picked up at a few harmonics. And the shorter now we make this so-called boxcar window, the further we spread out in frequency. So this means the more signal we collect at uh, the harmonics, and so we pull in more information from this direction, from, from in this uh, frequency uh, area. Now, what is what is the interesting part in the moment when you use a boxcar, for example, as a first stage in a tandem scheme, this allows you that the modulation on your short pulses, which create the sidebands at the harmonics, not only at the fundamental frequency of the of the carrier, uh, the boxcar can uh, can kind of measure those and capture those in addition, and therefore you can capture also the sidebands. The um, and not only at the fundamental. To show you uh, an example where the boxcar averager is used, not the tandem demodulation on the sidebands to be clear here. So this is a typical pump probe imaging um, with a normal standard confocal microscope. Here, um, the measurement is done for every, cell, for every pixel, the entire image is scanned and the data is ac acquired. And in the end, um, what was done in this work is uh, the, the, the images were recorded for the same signal to noise ratio, and then uh, the pixel dwell time was uh, compared. And we see that the box cut in this case uh, can, uh, can improve the measurement time by more than a factor of two. And this can be very important in the moment when you want to go for very for very fast media rates, for example, or when you want to uh, save precious measurement time. And with this, uh, with this outlook, I would like to summarize um, with what we learned today. First of all, um, we had a workflow uh, for a good lock-in measurement. We learned how a lock-in amplifier with an AFM FM, uh, demodulation works and uh, what it can actually measure. And we learned what a boxcar averager uh, does and what you can measure with it. But hopefully, and this is, I think, uh, the real take home message, I hope I could show you how you can save measurement time the next time you're in the lab, for example, by measuring multiple sidebands simultaneously in one measurement. With that, thanks for your attention and uh, back to you, Roman. Yes, thank you very much, Claudius, for this wonderful introduction uh, of lock-in amplifier and boxcar averager. So I like the shift in language from signal processing to actual information processing. This is a nice way of putting it. So I saw that there is a, a few questions already, but uh, please bear with us. So we will open the Q&A after the end of our second talk. So feel free to continue raising questions in the meantime. So we'll be happy to answer everything at the end in a few moments. So for, for now, so let's move on to our second presentation. So that will feature uh, two speakers, Professor Marcus Raschke and uh, his graduate student Samuel Johnson, who has been performing uh, some of the measurements presented today. Again, Marcus, let's uh, start sharing your presentation uh, when, when you want, while I go through the introduction. So, Marcus Raschke is professor at the Department of Physics and GILA at the University of Colorado at Boulder. His research is on the development and application of novel nano-optical spectroscopy and imaging techniques, including nonlinear and ultrafast nanospectroscopy in the field, in the near field, using both plasmonics and optical antennas. So, these techniques allow for new ways to control the light-matter interaction 
to image structure and dynamics of molecular and quantum matter on the nanoscale. He received his PhD in the year 2000 from the Max Planck Institute of Quantum Optics and the Technical University in Munich, Germany. Following research appointment at the University of California at Berkeley and the Max Born Institute in Berlin, he became faculty member at the University of Washington before moving with his group to Boulder already 10 years ago. And I guess this is where he's speaking now. So Marcus, we are all very excited to hear your talk. So please educate us, the floor is yours. Right, hello. Uh, thank you for uh, joining in. Um, and I, I'll thank uh, Zurich Instruments actually for this opportunity to share our work. Uh, I think uh, some of the technology which uh, Zurich Instruments developed um, has in fact been enabling for some of the work I'll show. And, um, and uh, I have actually always admired, uh, I think the company and how they have been very closely interacting uh, with the scientific community in many technology areas. Um, uh, and, and really uh, being very good as partners, I think, in many ways. And I have to say, I'm unfortunately not even paid for saying this. Uh, <laughs> actually, really, just my personal opinion. I, I think uh, a lot of companies uh, could actually benefit from, from a philosophy uh, of, of that kind uh, with people out of the, coming out of research, uh, starting uh, a, a industry company, which, which then feeds back into uh, enabling further new research. So, so what I will talk about is, is really a new dimension of, of optical uh, nanoprobe imaging uh, in spectroscopy. Uh, in particular, how over the last few years we, we have advanced this approach um, to really access uh, structure uh, of matter, and I will focus on molecular materials, uh, but then in particular associated coupling and dynamics in these materials which really defines uh, their functional behavior. Um, and what I will focus on in this talk uh, is really molecular vibrational spectroscopy. Um, and, and I will highlight really some of our recent breakthroughs, uh, in particular in precision uh, in ultra-fast nanospectroscopy uh, of coupled dynamics, which is particularly relevant in uh, perovskite photovoltaics. Uh, this is one of the highlights uh, of this talk but also I'll give a perspective then of uh, new molecular rulers uh, which allow us to probe uh, intermolecular interactions uh, and also uh, I'll give a perspective on vibrational quantum state control. So I'd, I'd like to thank actually in particular uh, our postdoc uh, Jun Nishida who came to us from Stanford uh, who has been pioneering some of the perovskite photovoltaic uh, nano imaging work um, and then uh, Sam Johnson uh, is a grad student who is actually uh, getting into the footsteps of June and uh, he will also speak about uh, two of the slides and highlight uh, actually some of the technical developments uh, and there are many other people who have actually really contributed to some of the work I'll show, uh, notably a collaboration with Sean Shaheen on, on the um, uh, perovskite uh, nanostructures. Uh, what I'd like to highlight really is also that um, uh, we have uh, been closely engaged uh, with uh, light source developments and application of new light sources for uh, infrared nano imaging. Um, so particular user facilities worldwide uh, in, in the US at the advanced light source using infrared synchrotron radiation, but also then in Brazil and with colleagues in uh, Berlin. Um, and so many of these facilities are actually accessible um, so if some of the type of nano imaging we do, uh, you can actually use some of these facilities and you can contact us or the, the beamline managers, uh, which would uh, allow, give you access. Um, and likewise, we've been working uh, on light source development in particular, but also scanning probe instrumentation with a number of companies. And I already mentioned uh, the interaction, uh, the fruitful interaction uh, really with, with Zurich. So uh, what are we trying to do for those who are not familiar really with, uh, with optical nano imaging? Uh, there has been a, a long time and general challenge in using scanning probe microscopy, notably atomic force microscopy or scanning tunneling microscopy, which gives you exquisite structural information about the material 
but have very limited spectroscopic uh, ability. And this is really when you uh, take advantage really of the optical antenna properties actually of, of many of these even conventional scanning probe tips. They allow you to nano localize an optical excitation um, to the apex uh, of this tip and then uh, through then the nano localized uh, light matter interaction you can get spectroscopic information as well as imaging information uh, at a spatial resolution which is similar to what the atomic force microscope already provides you given by the dimensions in particular the apex radius and so this form of near field light matter interaction then gives you access really to a few nanometer spatial uh, resolution and um, the a key feature really is that uh, we can probe uh, through optical spectroscopy the elementary processes uh, in matter uh, is particular in the visible to infrared uh, spectral range you couple directly to the electronic uh, and lattice motion uh, in a material and then in combination with short pulse excitation you can get uh, corresponding dynamic information and thus really get access to the elementary processes uh, in, in materials. And in general, you can combine the technique with any form uh, of optical uh, spectroscopy. So every technique uh, which works in principle in the far field, you can implement in the near field uh, with continuous wave or pulse excitation, uh, probing uh, elastic processes um, or inelastic like Raman or any form of nonlinear uh, and wave mixing um, interactions. Um, and so the spatial field confinement uh, at this apex really then provides you the ability to do super resolution imaging essentially with all optical modalities. But the type of information you can obtain actually even goes beyond that of uh, the plane wave excitation uh, in far field imaging because these high optical momentum states which are produced in the optical near field under the tip apex actually provide new optical uh, selection rules um, and this further really enhances uh, the light matter interaction and gives you really control um, at the fundamental level because the, actually the near field interaction is actually the more fundamental one where in the far field you only get a projection uh, of this plane wave field uh, and this is actually what limits spatial resolution uh, in normal uh, then diffraction limited uh, far field optics. Of course, uh, you do this at the expense that you do have to have uh, the scanning probe tip in close spatial proximity, of course, to the quantum state uh, you like to probe. So um, what, uh, what, what I'm showing here is really a little bit of vignette of uh, the different uh, directions uh, we pursue in our group based on the optical antenna probe uh, light matter interaction. Uh, we can probe quantum materials uh, of interest are phases and domains and quantum phase transitions, but also, and this has been now widely adopted, uh, that uh, many of the phenomena in 2D materials uh, can, be, can be studied with exquisite uh, sensitivity and actually new physical phenomena being discovered. Um, what I'll focus on this talk is really the uh, work on molecular and soft matter, in particular chemical imaging and, and probing molecular structure and associated coupling and dynamics and doing this also with the extension into the ultra-fast uh, regime. Um, and then lastly, I will actually touch on a topic uh, which goes beyond uh, sort of this uh, form of uh, conventional um, perturbative light matter interaction into the regime uh, of cavity uh, QED where I can actually show you that we can really achieve uh, molecular optomechanics um, and, and molecular light matter interaction down to the single quantum level. So what really defines uh, a molecular material uh, and the emergent function is that you understand that uh, in these materials uh, the property is more than the sum of the parts, so more than the sum of, of just the individual molecular identity. But what's equally important is that the intermolecular interaction is actually what gives rise to the emergent function in some of these materials uh, as defined through, for example, charge uh, in ion and energy transport, transport uh, in, from living material uh, to photophysical properties uh, in other photonic materials and synthetic 
uh, functional materials. And so this is true in, uh, in electronic materials where uh, order and disorder in crystallinity really define uh, the molecular uh, electronic materials properties. And the same is true in, in all the uh, energy materials, especially the photophysical processes where actually dynamic lattice and reaction fields uh, in uh, emergent new photo will take materials really define the properties. And, and of course, in any form of the nanobiomaterials, uh, including uh, life itself and, and how we function, uh, we're in the in liquid and in situ environment, uh, the intermolecular interactions define uh, the entire uh, process and, and life. So the, um, the infrared light matter interaction uh, in coupling actually to low energy carriers and, and actually probing the nuclear motion uh, in the form of the vibrational motion of the atoms and its uh, inter, intra and intermolecular bond potential really provides an exquisitely sensitive probe. Um, and so you can get uh, the uh, molecular identity through the characteristic vibrational resonances, uh, but also from the vibrational energy and specifically the line shape and the dynamic of the response, you get information about the details of this uh, nuclear bond potential and as such about the local chemical environment. And this local chemical environment of a molecule in terms of its, its uh, local fields uh, and charges and also bond strain and disorder uh, can be then indirectly uh, read out through uh, changes in this vibrational response. And so this is actually uh, what we like to do in the implementation of infrared scattering scanning near field uh, optical microscopy where we want to probe uh, this molecular dynamics on the quantum level uh, with nanometer in fact the second resolution uh, and precision uh, to really probe these low energy excitations in matter which define their function uh, from vibrational and lattice response to low energy electronic and, and also uh, polaritonic and in quantum materials also uh, magnons and other uh, low energy phenomena. Um, so the uh, we have achieved this goal actually by a number of, of technical advances in infrared SNOM over the years. Um, and so uh, the technique has traditionally been fairly slow and narrow band and a lot of static uh, imaging um, and limited sensitivity uh, and, and primarily an ambient condition and then often uh, with some limited spectral resolution and precision. And to address this problem, uh, this is where we have focused on a lot of light source development and implementation of new light sources. I mentioned already synchrotron radiation, but also new femtosecond uh, infrared light sources have been enabling. Um, and then uh, in combination then with uh, really dynamic and multi-parameter imaging, uh, we have been able to really advance the field in a number of ways, which are now adopted also by other uh, colleagues in the community. Um, whether from polarization result imaging, you're able to then uh, actually probe molecular order uh, in, uh, in the implementation of optical uh, crystallography in the infrared. We have been able to do uh, dynamic and in situ uh, imaging in a number of applications. Um, and the highlight of this talk uh, will be the, how we probe perovskite polarons, which is the, the core element and function of these new photovoltaic materials all the way to actually vibrational wave function imaging. So before I give you these specific examples, just to highlight on the on the perovskite, uh, I'll actually hand over to Sam, uh, who will uh, is a key lab member who has actually implemented a lot of these uh, of these of these uh, technically enabling and challenging experiments. And so he will talk about uh, some of. Uh, the, the, the measurement principles as it relates back uh, to what actually Claudius has presented about uh, the, how, how the login is used in these experiments. Thank you for the introduction, Marcus. Uh, as you said, I'll be talking about how we use the login amplifier to actually acquire our near field signal. So in a typical experimental setup, we have a uh, broadband laser source that we then send into an asymmetric interferometer. Uh, the asymmetric interferometer has two arms where one arm contains the AFM and the sample of interest, and the other arm contains the reference mirror. Uh, the AFM tip, as Marcus mentioned, acts as an optical antenna and localizes the uh, near field signal. 
uh, which we then heterodyne amplify with the reference arm and detects on the MCT detector. Uh, during this process, we uh, oscillate the cantilever uh, up and down, as shown in the bottom left. And as the cantilever approaches the sample surface, the nonlinear near field interaction increases when the tip is closest to the sample. Uh, as mentioned previously, uh, this uh, series of nonlinear interactions with the sample creates a set of harmonics where the higher harmonics lead to a more localized near field signal. The intensity that we detect then is a combination of the reference field and the uh, polarization from the uh, tip sample area. And when we scan the reference arm to vary the optical path difference, we produce an interferogram, uh, which we can then Fourier transform. And given the asymmetric nature of the Michelson interferometer, uh, recover both the amplitude and phase of the sample response. Uh, we can do this then uh, over multiple sample uh, positions by changing the sample position relative to AF and tip and perform spectroscopy across a sample as shown in this image on the right. Uh, here we're plotting a spectral analysis that gives the crystallinity as a function of spatial location on an RU OEP uh, crystalline sample. So uh, an extension of this, in addition to just doing the uh, near field extraction, we can also do sideband analysis for background subtraction. So this is done in a few different modalities, but the first two I'm going to be talking about are amplitude and phase modulation within the reference arm of the interferometer. So one example is uh, we can add in a uh, chopper wheel into the reference arm of the interferometer, and this will also produce sidebands, again, as shown previously uh, in the talk. Uh, these sidebands then uh, can be analyzed instead of the center uh, second harmonic frequency that we typically use for near field extraction to get just the near field times the reference field contribution. Similarly, this can be done via phase modulation with the piezo mirror um, on the reference arm itself. One application of using a chopper wheel to remove the background uh, signals from the uh, far field contamination essentially is in what we call the rotating frame. In this case, we use prior knowledge about the finite line width of the uh, laser source that we are using and we can subtract off the carrier frequency and uh, then just analyze the rotating wave uh, signal instead. We can use this and compare this against conventional imaging as shown in the uh, bottom right of this panel. Uh, here on the top, we have a conventional image where uh, the resolution is reasonable, uh, but in a given amount of time uh, cannot be increased beyond this. However, directly beneath it, we have a much higher resolution image that was acquired within the same amount of time uh, through the benefits of going into this rotating frame. Uh, finally, as a lead into the, some of the work with the perovskites, uh, we also can uh, send in a second optical pulse. Uh, the second optical pulse in our case is a visible pulse, which we then modulate so that we can detect the infrared pulse that is then affected by the ultra fast response of our sample. Um, by using, again, the sideband analysis. Depending on how we modulate this second optical pulse, either with a chopper wheel um, giving a square wave pat pattern or with an AOM that gives us more of a close to a sinusoidal pattern, we can then change the distribution of the um, sidebands around the center peak that we are trying to collect. And so with this, I'm going to hand it back to you, Marcus. Thank you very much. So what these, uh, what these technical implementation really allow us is then to really probe molecules in an interacting environment as, as they define the function. And so the information we get is really simultaneously the molecular identity. Uh, we get information about the chemical environment um, uh, through, this, uh, through the molecular coupling, uh, and then uh, the dynamic processes where we can really probe uh, from femtosecond dynamics up to really kinetic processes up to the second uh, scale. Um, so as many of you know, uh, in the example of, of metal halide perovskites, that since their discovery in 2009, in, in only about 10 years, uh, where the solar cell efficiency uh, rose from actually only about 4% uh, now to over 25% approaching actually silicon uh, performance. And what's exciting about it is that really contrary uh, to inorganics, where it's very critical uh, to have single crystals with very high purity and very low defect density, that almost miraculously, actually, that 
in in the uh, in the perovskite lattice, it's the this soft lattice um, which actually leads to uh, polar run formation, um, and this actually makes uh, that uh, performance of the photovoltaic response uh, much more robust to defects. And so it's this dynamic lattice configuration and reconfiguration which stabilizes these photo-induced carriers. Um, but at the same time, uh, this comes at a cost that uh, as a result of this uh, softness of the lattice, it is actually then uh, also very sensitive uh, to uh, and, and, and uh, promotes uh, structural instability. And so this trade-off is uh, what one wants to understand. And uh, there has been a huge body of work, of course, studying really from the elementary processes on the, on the atomic lattice position all the way to grain and film level, uh, the emergence of this uh, functionality. And this is actually where it turns out that the application of infrared nanoimaging provides for a fantastically uh, exquisitely sensitive probe uh, to really uh, understand uh, a lot of these phenomena. And so, so while spatial variations have actually been identified over multiple length scales in the optoelectronic response of, of perovskites, what's really unclear has been if uh, what is this relationship between this uh, between this heterogeneity and, and this soft cap ion lattice interaction. And so, what we'll do here is actually that we'll apply then a multivariate infrared vibrational nanoimaging of this. Uh, form a form form a medium uh, cation um, by probing its vibrational response then as a as a local probe of its interaction with the lattice, uh, and so what we measure is from uh, in, uh, these uh, vibrational free induction decay measurements in the Fourier transform, which Sam was showing, that we extract the key parameter which to define the line shape, and each of which really relates to a particular property of the material. And so the the um, uh, we get uh, from peak position information about the the coupling uh, of this uh, of of the of the vibrational motion to the lattice structure. Um, from the line widths, uh, we can extract the vibrational dynamics in coupling to the lattice, uh, and then simply from the amplitude and the amplitude variation, we get information about the heterogeneity of the composition. And so we really have. Uh, from this full response function in complex phase and amplitude, uh, we get information about composition structure uh, and dynamics of the uh, of the perovskite. And so then we study this really as a uh, as a function of evolution under variable uh, external conditions. For example, uh, looking at the effect of water vapor annealing, where we can study the emergence and growth and uh, of, of these different uh, grains and domains, uh, which are actually hypothesized in, in different ways, how they inhibit or actually facilitate even uh, the uh, uh, the uh, the carrier flow. Uh, and so, while probing uh, these three parameters, then we can actually do a correlative analysis and, and study really the correlation of composition uh, cation lattice coupling and the associated really few picosecond vibrational. Uh, dynamics. And so uh, what this implies is really in particular from the analysis of the correlation of line uh, positions of frequency position of the vibrational oscillator uh, in the associated uh, dynamic coupling uh, to the lattice is that we can associate this actually uh, to a reaction field which is associated actually with the heterogeneity in the cesium cation uh, distribution. And then this associated spatial vari variation in the elasticity of this lattice, uh, this is actually uh, what leads to uh, this disorder in the charge phonon coupling uh, and this related polaron uh, formation. And this is really where the control of this polaron formation is then really what's, what's relevant really to improve uh, the perovskite uh, photovoltaics. And so in order to really watch uh, this polaron formation and the polaron dynamics in, in real space, time, and frequency. This is actually what we then want to measure directly in the time domain, and, and this brings the challenge. Um, and, and this has actually been a longstanding goal of our group and that of others to really combine uh, then scanning probe optical imaging with ultra-fast uh, pump probe techniques for, for really 
uh, being able to do ultra fast nano imaging and so watching quantum dynamics in, in space and time. Um, and so clearly you want to use short pulse excitation to probe the ultra fast dynamics and then uh, in this the structure information uh, from the scanning probe techniques to do ultra fast and, and also ultra broadband uh, nano imaging, which is broadly applicable. Now this has actually been uh, a continuous effort over many groups, uh, in particular over say, is a, is a renewed or strong effort over the last six years, uh, where uh, different uh, avenues have been pursued and, and, and progress has been made uh, in work of pushing really to get simultaneous time and, and energy resolution. This was for probing actually uh, ultra fast carrier dynamics. Um, in, in our group, we have emphasized uh, far from equilibrium excitation probing quantum phase transitions, where we emphasized really the time and spatial resolution. And then uh, what uh, overarches a lot of these efforts is of course, uh, to do this all background and artifact free. And, and what we have achieved actually, uh, and this is in particular Jun Nishida's work uh, most recently, and uh, we're in particular excited about really to show these first results, is that we are able to do ultra fast heterodyne pump probe uh, infrared nano imaging, which combines all attributes. And so this allows us really uh, to probe the ultra fast heterogeneity in sort of these low energy interactions uh, with far from equilibrium excitation. So we can do this with high pulse excitation, uh, and then we can really probe with spatial resolution. We get the femtosecond to picosecond time resolution and simultaneously the spectral resolution. And we can do this uh, in a completely artifact free way and this will really allow us to probe the quantum phase transitions. And uh, as I'll show you, the first application uh, in the Polaron formation, and then really study transient uh, molecular vibrational response uh, on the nanoscale. Uh, and so the first step was really to implement, as, as Sam was actually saying, the uh, first get uh, the phase uh, response and the phase sensitivity uh, through uh, the pump modulation where the pump leads to uh, this uh, photoelectronic excitation in the material, and then we probe uh, the transient uh, vibrational uh, or electronic response um, through this time delayed uh, probe pulse. Uh, and then through the interferometric detection, then we get then either the phase or then the full spectral uh, resolution of the probe pulse. So we can probe for each time delay, the full spectral response of the material. So here, just as a first step was to get the phase resolution. This was an important first application um, to show actually that in the uh, photo-induced metal insulator transition, for example, uh, in this quantum material of vanadium dioxide, which undergoes the phase transition from a uh, insulating, uh, insulating uh, state into then a photo-induced metallic phase, uh, where we could actually see that we, we do have uh, a phase resolve uh, or phase change associated uh, with the uh, with the probe pulse, um, and then into the full uh, spectral response, uh, where we probe at variable time delays. Now the full spectral uh, signature uh, of the uh, of the probe response, and and this allows us now to resolve uh, this polaron. So this is really this uh, polarized lattice response as a result. Uh, of uh, the carrier excitation, which stabilizes uh, these photo-induced carriers, so they don't form uh, strongly bound excitons. And this is actually what facilitates the photovoltaic response uh, in perovskite photovoltaics. Um, and so uh, this spectroscopic signature you, you see is really uh, this polaron absorption. Um, and then as we do take these measurements as a function of time delay, uh, then we can really study this polaron coupling uh, to the cation. Um, and so we can resolve the heterogeneity then in the density and dynamics. And this is really the fundamental origin of the photovoltaic heterogeneity. And so what you see in, in now in this movie here is really as a function of time delay, uh, the heterogeneity in this, in this polaron response. And then you can analyze these data and then you get actually uh, the variation in uh, the polaron dynamics uh, for each image pixel. Um, and so what you're looking here at is really the first time the real space, real frequency, and real time uh, response of 
the response of the system to a photo-induced carrier, which then leads to the subsequent photovoltaic signal in a, in a photovoltaic device. And this is really the elementary step which defines and then uh, controls the device performance. And so data like these allow you then to help optimize uh, by varying synthetic parameter than the photovoltaic performance. So in contrast to the conventional approach of sort of a macroscopic or even with some microscopic techniques, is that you always had looked at an average, ensemble average or time average or energy average response. So now you get sort of this full, uh, fully resolved response function of this Polaron formation and its dynamics. So I want to conclude now by just saying that Related experiments can be done in a wide range of materials. Uh, here's an example of where we study vibrational excitons. Uh, this is in molecular electronic materials, where we were able to show that the vibrational wave function delocalization uh, between different molecular constituents in the formation of nanocrystals of this material really gives rise to kinetically trapped defects, even though you may have macroscopically a high degree of macroscopic crystallinity. Um, and these are effects which really control carrier transport, uh, also in ways which is difficult actually to resolve or image with, with any other technique. Um, and since we have in the process of these studies advanced the sensitivity for vibrational spectroscopy really to the near elementary quantum limit, that's actually where then uh, the idea was born that we should be able actually to do also uh, push into this cavity QED regime um, with the nano cavity, which forms between the tip and the molecular oscillator and an appropriate uh, counter antenna structures forming a nano cavity, we are in these nano and pico cavities, we can control actually then at the uh, single uh, bond and single photon level, hopefully uh, in this vibration and strong coupling regime, the ability then to do single molecule detection and even vacuum field photochemistry and, and then even molecular qubits. Uh, this is an emergent field uh, where a number of groups uh, coming from uh, either photochemistry and, and uh, cavity optomechanics uh, have been working together. And, and this is actually a, a truly interdisciplinary effort of, of chemistry and fundamental physics, um, which uh, we can carry then into this regime of uh, the uh, nano localized light interaction where particularly the small mode volume enables to this nano localized field enables uh, this hybridization of a photon field uh, in a vibrational quantum state. So with that, I'd like to summarize by just putting back sort of this introductory slide, which I had where I highlighted really uh, that we have come a long way uh, of, of optical antenna based nano imaging for a wide range of, of application. Uh, and I, I think we have just reached really this exciting milestone, especially in ultra-fast nano imaging, uh, to June and Sam's work uh, on really probing in space, time, uh, and frequency. Uh, this was sort of a, a vision uh, how we actually got into this field uh, more than a decade ago, and I think we have just reached uh, that goal. And and we definitely look forward uh, for you know more coming in the future. Um, and so with that, I'll thank for your attention. And, and if you have questions, please submit them. Uh, we will we'll answer them either me directly to you or, or in other ways. Uh, we'll look forward to uh, hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you very much, yeah, Marcus. So that was uh, yeah, very nice to share all that with us. And so we have accumulated a lot of questions during this uh, two presentation. Uh, so we will not indeed be able to go through all of them, but uh, okay, so let's start with uh, a rather fundamental question that was also asked during the talk of uh, Claudius. So where is the nonlinearity coming from? That question was asked from Yi. So maybe Still Claudius, there. if you... Yeah, um, but also, yeah. Which, which nonlinearity are we referring to? Yes, it's true. I, I guess that's why you can. So I, I, the question arises when uh, Claudius uh, during Claudius' presentation, which was very generic, of course. But maybe yes, uh, Marcus, you can uh, you can uh, point out to some very specific nonlinearities in this case. I see. Okay. So yeah, let me share this uh, one slide again here. Um, So 
So there are there are two ways. Uh, I think one one of the nonlinearity uh, is simply a result um, of the uh, the tip sample interaction uh, is the signal which arises is nonlinear uh, with respect to the distance of the tip, um, and and so it's highly nonlinear because this tightly confined optical field then interacts increasingly efficiently, in particular in the last few nanometers as the tip interacts with the sample. Uh, the nonlinearity in the form of the nonlinear optical signal is a different nature. This is the nonlinear optical response. When you have a strong optical driving field, then the optical response of a material is then no longer proportional linearly to the intensity of the field but becomes nonlinear, and this gives rise then to uh, wave mixing and uh, other higher order nonlinear frequencies. Um, and this is actually a feature that also in uh, optical nanoprobe imaging, because of this tightly confined field, you, you enhance uh, this localized field. Um, also, uh, selection rules change uh, where uh, the nonlinear response then, which is normally uh, phase sensitive and needs phase matching, uh, now some of these restrictions are lifted uh, in the in the uh, nanoscale volume. This is tightly confined field, um, and so this actually gives it for a very rich new regime actually of of nonlinear nano optics. Yeah. Okay. So that's really at the root of the nano optical cavity. All these nonlinearities. So maybe we have some question uh, a bit more technical on how uh, it was uh, implemented and um, or some possible uh, effect so so how how do you account for thermal effect in sensitive measurement using ultra fast infrared nano imaging so i guess i guess the question is related to uh do you do you have some thermal drift or is this an, an issue at all so, so the, either sam or generally, Marcus? yeah so generally the infrared uh, light um, does not lead to a strong interaction with the tip itself, so so there is a very minimal uh, response. Of course, you have to keep the excitation intensity low enough so that you are not warming up the material too much, um, because clearly by pumping a vibrational resonance, that energy gets dissipated into the molecular manifold and leads to thermal expansion. But because the the tip is interacting and controlled in its distance to the sample to the atomic force microscope signal. Um, and this is actually what we take advantage of in, in some of the uh, multi-parameter imaging where we probe actually uh, simultaneously always with the optical signal and topography or other uh, material parameter which are a result of the, of the cantilever a phase response uh, which actually relate for example to dissipation and deformation of the material so you get this simultaneously um, changes in the nanomechanical response, which is associated then with some of the thermal effects. Uh, you can actually resolve these and then uh, look at correlations and, and again, their interactions uh, with changes then in the IR vibrational response, which is of course also uh, temperature dependent. Okay, so you can really distinguish that. And I guess there is a related question on um, the interferometric beam. So do you use uh, an active feedback to stabilize this? I guess this is more of an issue when you are at synchrotron experiment? Or is so it not an issue at all? Because of the long wavelengths of the IR light, uh, over the course of a measurement time, uh, you don't need to worry too much about, um, uh, about interferometer drifts. This is an issue extending uh, this into the near IR invisible. Uh, in those cases, uh, you need to increasingly think about active stabilization of the of the interferometer, especially for long measurement times. Okay, makes sense. Okay, so maybe let's ask a question to 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 Claudius. Um, so, when collecting uh, multiple sideband information, so would the amplitude and phase of each peak be analyzed separately? And I guess this goes uh, along also. How many could you actually measure? Um, so yes, absolutely. With the direct AMFM demodulation, you can measure uh, all sidebands in amplitude and phase, and the maximum you can analyze up to eight of them. Okay, so that means eight phase, eight amplitude. 
Yes, yeah. eight times the face, eight times the amplitude. Yeah, so let's have just a few more questions. Uh, that's uh, uh, going back to, to Marcus, a fairly general one as well. So um, so why do you use the broadband source in the first place from Wichi? Yeah, so there has been a development in the field and maybe let me see, do I have a suitable slide? Uh, maybe, maybe not, let me answer this without slide. So, uh, there are two ways to do spectroscopy. You can either uh, use a broadband source and then use uh, either grading spectrometers or uh, Fourier transform techniques to do get spectral resolution, or you can use narrow band lasers and tune the laser. So generally in laser tuning, uh, and then you always have laser drifts in intensity and other thermal effects and beam shape. And, um, and so this makes actually laser tuning um, a lot more difficult um, to normalize and account for all these variations which happen in the experiment with the laser as you tune its wavelengths compared to uh, this multiplexing uh, which you have when you uh, have a broadband laser pulse which even that varies where you can average over that variation and then of course uh, the price you pay is that you have to tune something so you tune the interferometer um, but that is something which you have much more under control than you actually have a tunable laser under control. So this is why most of the of the IR spectroscopy in particular uh, is going also for these applications towards broadband sources, synchrotron or femtosecond lasers, or even just a thermal light source compared to say quantum cascade lasers, which you need a frequency to. And that motivated the development of a new laser source. Some of that is related guess, to the yeah. birth development, of course, and also uh, it's the only way to have a short laser pulse um, where you automatically get the broad bandwidth. So the shorter laser pulse, the higher the bandwidth. Okay, thank you very much. So let's jump uh, to, to Claudius again. So what, uh, what uh, would be the shortest temporal window for the box car averager? And I guess this is related to what would be the shortest pulse width that you can detect with a box car? Yeah, I mean, uh, basically it goes down to the sampling rate of the instrument, uh, which is 1.8 giga samples. So we are talking there about basically a single sample um, on with uh, something like 555 picoseconds. Uh, still, I would uh, recommend always to stay a little bit longer because uh, the likelihood is very high that you miss uh, a signal then if you restrict yourself so much. And of course, also the detector uh, has to support this. So you always have to ensure that uh, you combine the detector to the instrument that both match ideally. So I would, uh, we can go below a nanosecond, but I would always recommend to stay on the order of, uh, let's say a few nanoseconds. Yeah, but you can still carry information from femtosecond pulses. So you can still measure some some of that, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I'm afraid we are running out of time. We are already a bit uh, behind schedule. Uh, so let's thank uh, our awesome speaker one more time. So Marcus, Claudius, it has been a great pleasure hosting you. So I think uh, we all learned a lot of uh, nice tricks and we've witnessed some very nice uh, new results. And I'm sure everybody enjoys this. And um, so I would like to thank, of course, uh, all our attendees. I think we got uh, one of the best attended webinars so far, as far as I could tell. Uh, so I'm glad that the topic raised a lot of interest. Um, so, and we will gather, of course, all women in question and summarize that uh, uh, in the blog, as I mentioned earlier. So. Yeah, just before we, we conclude, so so we also like a challenging project and new application. I think Marcus showed some very challenging application. Um, so uh, feel free to challenge us, ask us direct question, and uh, you can also get more information on zins.com and browse our product and application pages. And uh, just before we close this session, uh, so I'd like to point you towards more webinar coming up in the next uh, few months. Uh, that will uh, cover some topics related to what we have discussed. I mean, 
mostly on qubit control. Of course, here we have talked about nano, some nano cavity uh, QED. It would be more like cavity QED. And we will also have a webinar on scanning probe techniques for electrical characterization with time resolution. So thanks again to everybody. I hope you enjoyed this today's, uh, today's webinar and uh, see you soon.